morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think it's an amazing opportunity to stand in front of, I guess, my home crowd, Cape Town. I'm not originally from Cape Town, but um, made it home after 13 years. And I think, yeah, what we have for you today is, I think, in a very exciting investment opportunity that one you really need to think about for your clients, um, for our emerging market fund, which I'm going to talk to you today about. So, when I think about emerging markets, um, the transformation of these specific countries, in my opinion, is nicely uh, captured by um, an avid proponent of the Asian century. His name's Kishore Mebubani, and he is an ex-Singaporean diplomat, a writer as well as an academic, and he basically has said that Oh, and this is, I've, I've actually had to write this down. So the rise of emerging markets is not a trend, but a tectonic shift in the global economic landscape. It represents a fundamental rebalancing of power and influence in the world. So if we just stop and consider for a moment what's played out in emerging markets, if you think to the last two, three decades, you've seen this rapid economic growth and this has been driven by factors such as increasing populations, you've had rapid urbanization, and you've seen rise in middle income classes as well as these key, I think, opportunities in terms of infrastructure and technological development. And I think this visual I have up here clearly showcases what I'm talking about. So here you have the skyline of China, uh, sorry, Shanghai, a city in China, and you can see how it's basically transformed over time. It's undergone a significant metamorphosis, and this is obviously off the back of significant capital deployment and investment by the Chinese government and other parties. But look at how the skyline has just basically transformed. You see a lot of skyscrapers, and that was nothing 30 years ago. I came across an interesting stat the other day, and it said, China, in terms of the number of high-rises and skyscrapers, outnumbers the U.S. by a ratio of 3.5 to 1. It has in excess of 2,900 skyscrapers in comparison to the U.S.'s 857. Now, just consider that for a moment. So, in addition to, obviously, this rapid infrastructure opportunity set that is present for investors to tap into, you also have China and India forecasted to actually drive the increase in the middle income classing. And the OECD has forecasted that by the year 2030, the middle income class grouping will account for 50% of the population. That's the global population. And as this growth comes through, and as you see this rapid urbanization play out, what's going to happen is it's going to significantly increase consumer demand and expand these consumer-driven sectors, the likes of e-commerce, technology, semiconductors, you name it, electronics, that are really going to create an attractive opportunity set for investors. But I'm just going to pause there and say, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a China and India story. There are 24 emerging markets that we trade across. And that's on different continents, from Latin America to emerging Europe to Africa. And if I think of another sort of very profound opportunity, it's in Brazil. So in Brazil, um, it's been coined to be the, the breadbasket of the globe. And it is that for reasons. It's the leading exporter when you think about soya beans, coffee, beef, and I've read an article which said, Brazil will surpass the United States of America and become the leading corn exporter to the globe in the year 2023. So there's definitely a diverse opportunity set that's available to, to investors to tap into. From a global nominal GDP perspective, how do emerging markets show up? And you can have a look at the graph, and you can see there's been an acceleration in terms of growth and contribution to GDP from emerging markets over the last two decades. And at the end of 2022, emerging markets accounted for 43% of this GDP contribution. However, 
What do we see in terms of capital market representation? It doesn't look the same. Only 11% of global equity capital markets, uh, you have a representation coming from emerging markets. So there's definitely a mismatch. There's definitely a disparity. But as these governments you know, reduce their trade barriers as they tend to sort of, you know, do better in terms of market reforms. If, uh, if they continue to develop out their financial sectors, what you're going to see is a decrease in that mismatch between your global economic footprint on my right-hand side and your capital market representation from emerging markets coming through over the next, say, 10 to 20 years. But just thinking about emerging markets and, and, you know, looking at how they've developed over time, you find that they've really matured to really rise and become an asset class in their own right. And what I mean by that is if I think back to the late 80s, if I think back to the 90s, you had a, se a series of significant regional bubbles or crises that really impacted these nations. If I think back to the 80s, you had the Latin American crisis. If I think back to the early 90s, you had the Asian currency crisis. And what played out is you had contagion and risk spread to the adjacent countries within the region, all impacting those regions pr quite profoundly. However, if you think back to the last two decades, it's been very stable in emerging markets. It's, we can't really think about an incident. Maybe Russia happened last year, and Russia invaded Ukraine but you didn't see a contagion effect spread to adjacent countries within that region. You know, China continued to actually do subpar, and India, South Korea actually did quite well. So um, really matured, and I think really offering investors quite an amazing opportunity. From a growth perspective, you can also see it coming through nicely. The IMF has actually forecasted that global growth by the year 2024 will be 3%. But let's pause and see where that's coming from. Have a look at advanced economies. Forecasted to deliver an anemic 1.4% in 2024. However, emerging markets and developed economies, 4.2%. So really profound growth coming from these, um, this universe of emerging market countries in comparison to advanced economies. Um, and just thinking around, you know, just to add, here's a bit of a story. So if we think back to the global financial crisis, 2008, if we think back to even recently COVID in 2020, what you found is that emerging market countries were actually adopting far more robust, far more orthodox monetary and fiscal policies. So they were running lower levels of trade deficit, um, they were targeting lower levels of inflation. And what played out is that in those big crises moments in 2008, in 2020, they were far more resilient than their developed market counterparts. And in fact, in the subsequent years, post those crises, they actually rebounded quite more firmly and stronger. So not only from an economic perspective, but also from in terms of how they run their countries, um, I believe they're doing far more better job. Finally, from an valuations perspective, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at, at the first line, we're looking at valuation metrics, the price to earnings, price to book, and dividend yield of emerging markets, right? They look far more attractive, not only versus their history, but also relative to developed market counterparts. Your darker shades of green are actually highlighting your more attractive, cheaper valuations, and your darker shades of reds and oranges are your less attractive valuations, so they're far more expensive. And quite interesting to see emerging markets trading at a 12 times earnings versus the US, second last line, trading at a 22 times earnings, nearly doubled. And interestingly enough, over the last 10 years, in the brackets you'll see, those were valuations about 10 years ago, 2012. The US has become far more expensive versus emerging markets, which have stayed at relatively similar levels. So from a price to book and a dividend yield perspective, and we all know dividend yield is a good predictor of future returns. So if that's the case, from a valuations perspective, emerging markets are definitely far better placed to outperform their developed market counterparts in the next few years or so. 
finally, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm going to end here and then ask my panelists to join me. So why does this matter to investors like us, right? So I've given you a whole lot of facts and statistics and information making my case for why I believe there's an incredible opportunity set available in emerging markets. Um, but if that doesn't convince you, let's think back to what Kishore Mebavani said. Remember, he's a strong advocate of the Asian century, and he's not the only sort of, um, I think, voice in the room when it comes to you know, having a strong case for emerging markets. There's the likes of Ray Dalio, who's also a strong advocate. And he's basically, and I'll summarize, saying emerging markets are on a rise. We see the shift from, from west to east, where they're definitely going to play a more important role, not only from an economic perspective, but also from a geopolitical perspective. And I think we see some of that playing out today. And just another important data point, and I think this brings it home for me, is if you invest into your largest global equity czar denominated funds within the SA context, what's available to you? for your investors within those funds is only developed market exposure. So I believe here we have an opportunity to really diversify and tap into these emerging markets. Um, diversifying your portfolio is number one, but also then giving your clients the opportunity to benefit from, I think in a profound manner, um, true sense, in a true sense of the word, a growth opportunity that will play out in the next coming a few years or so. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if I can welcome my fellow panelists to join me on the stage, we'll continue the discussion. Sibra, I'm going to start with you. You guys hold some emerging markets exposure in the funds that you manage also. What do you like about emerging markets? I, mean, I think Benusha told the story and showed visually um, the attractive growth prospects of economies. Uh, but for our side, we actually go further than that. I think the story in emerging markets are the unique companies that you can get exposure to. For instance, if you take this particular fund that uh, Venetia is talking about, the biggest holding is a company that affects all of us in this room. Uh, and that company, I think is 13.2% of the fund, is called Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, um, which is TSMC. Now, why is this an important company? So this company makes, I suppose in the simplest sense, chips. And obviously, remember, in 2020, 2021, there was this whole thing about a chip shortage. You couldn't get cars, you couldn't get computers, you couldn't get screens, you couldn't get TVs. There's one company that does most of this. They have 52.7% of the market share in, in chips. And all these Apple products, so Apple's their biggest customer, I think, Apple buys 25% of their supply into the world. And again, so this particular company um, supplies Apple, and so all Apple devices run on Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing um, chips. And so very important company that if you took it out of the world, there's a lot of things that won't work, and we found that out. And so for us, it's the unique stories like that. And the last point on this specific company, TSMC, is the sense that, one, it has grown astronomically, but if you look at it, it's like, what's really special about it? Its intellectual capital is phenomenal. Um, it employs about 78,000 or so people, of which 41,000 of them have at least a master's, if not a PhD. So very smart people, high growth, very important in the world of electronics, and yet not many people know about it. But that's the kind of stuff we get, like to expose our clients to. I think most people in the audience and investors in general would have been aware for emerging markets as an opportunity for a while, but it's been perilous. Yeah. It's been difficult to actually yeah. lock in those returns. Yes. What's the reason for that? What are some of the challenges that you've observed? Um, and I say this particularly knowing that in your past life you used yeah. to manage um, Global Emerging Markets Fund for Mutual. Yes. So I've spent eight years of my career um, being part of and then being a, a fund manager in a global emerging markets fund. And we used to spend three, four, five months of the year for all of that time traveling the world, meeting some of the most exciting and interesting companies in emerging markets. And emerging markets have always promised a lot. They have promised a lot. I mean, the presentations look good, but they have not really delivered. So why? Why is there a gap? And what we realized was that before analyzing emerging markets, Emerging markets have issues when it comes to governance. 
So in South Africa, we live in South Africa. We go and meet management of companies in South Africa. These are generally very honest uh, to do people, and they disclose very well. So everything in South Africa is pretty transparent. The minute you leave South Africa, though, and you go to emerging economies, wow, the level of disclosure, the level of governance, actually that takes away from emerging markets. So it's very, very difficult to find great businesses that are exceptional. They exist, but you've got to go through a lot. So when we used to analyze it, the first thing before our analysts even bothered doing an analysis, we used to do this questionnaire, 100 questions, just to test the governance and the robustness of the governance of these companies. And the, my final point in terms of illustrating this, um, the biggest company that South African uh, investors and pension funds are exposed to is is NASPES, NASPES process, which then, its biggest investment is Tencent. That's where the money is made. Um, yeah, because in the other bits that they invest in, the money is lost. But Tencent, uh, where the money is made. And what is interesting is if you have to go to the website, Tencent's website, it's one of the most influential companies in the world, and download their disclosure and their annual report, Truworths, which is a company you guys are familiar with, has much, much greater detail of disclosure than that company. And that is the difference in emerging markets. The governance is a problem, um, and it's not as great. So that's why. Thanks, Sibu. Nicole, I'm going to bring you into the conversation. Um, can you give us an overview of what responsible investing is, and maybe shed some light on how it can help us navigate emerging markets a bit better? Sure, so I'm happy to. So when, when we talk about responsible investing, it's really about two core components of our investment approach. The first part is around how we decide where to put the money, right? So in that sort of asset deployment, and that's where we're taking a look at what you would traditionally consider to be non-financial factors, so all your environmental, social, governance factors, and we're trying as best we can to assign a financial value to that, and that feeds into the risk-adjusted return calculations for that business. So a, a good example is if we do think if there's a company that has poor governance and we know they're likely to be fined, we have an actual number that we can in incorporate in that that can affect the value of that company. So that's the first part, is how do we decide where to put the money? The second part is, once we've decided to put our money somewhere, we're a long-term investor, right? So our preference is to remain invested in perpetuity until there's some reason not to be. And so that means that we can't be an uh, absentee landlord, like we can't put our money into a company and then turn around and never look at it again. And that's where we become active owners of those assets. So we're actively engaging with them, we're stewarding those companies. So what Siva talks about, about actually meeting with these companies, right, and getting to understand them, making sure that we are consistently revising what are the most important environmental, social, governance, risks and opportunities and make sure that the companies are actually taking advantage of those and mitigating against those in a way that makes sense. In the emerging market context, this is incredibly important because as Benicia was saying, these markets evolve rapidly. Things change very quickly. There isn't always a lot of data that's publicly available in sort of a uh, perfectly curated, uh, integrated annual report. So you need to have sort of boots on the ground and actually get to know these companies and interact with them. Emerging markets simultaneously are, they are paradoxical in the, in the sense that when you see this push now to more responsible in ways of, uh, ways of investing or this transition to more sustainable and more inclusive economies, emerging markets have a lot of work to do. They're often uh, suffering the worst in terms of the impacts, the negative impacts, but they're also where the greatest opportunity lies, right? So when you think about the new normal in the world that we're transitioning into, everything from your sort of transition minerals and green metals that are going to be in the next generation of technologies all the way through to the renewable energies and sort of sun, wind, water, and things like the new consumers and even land that's available for things like reforestation for carbon credits. All of that is concentrated in emerging markets. So it makes all the sense in the world to have this kind of approach that's looking at this company not for what it is right now, but what it could potentially be in the new normal, in the future, and being able to value that company on what it's going to look like and then sort of work with it and bring in what we know from international best practice from markets like South Africa where we're very comfortable and apply that to these markets and try, try to sort of raise that standard and work with them. So in that sense, the responsible investment approach is really, it's the only way that you can feasibly take full advantage of the opportunity that you face in emerging markets. Thanks for that, Nicole. Um, now, both Benicia and Cebu's investment teams work and collaborate with, with your responsible investment team. 
Benicia, can you share with us how you and your team work with the RI team? And then after you, perhaps Cebu can also do the same. Thanks, Consilia. So if you hold an index fund, um, and we understand what we understand of index funds, so it's maybe 130 to 140 constituents within the SA context that you would get exposure to. So as an index manager, I don't want to say we're forced, but um, we are basically mandated to hold all exposures across those 130 counters. So where Nicole and her team definitely, I think, give indexation or all make a competitive advantage is in the active stewardship case. So as Nicole has mentioned, they are on a continuous basis engaging with company management, with boards, with um, the FSCA, with the JSC to try and see how we can forward how we can really do more in terms of, you know, companies really incorporating ESG practices and standards in terms of how they operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about an indexation fund, highly commoditized. So you will know exactly when we are not tracking perfectly. For example, you'll have a look at our performance differentials. You'll have a look at our tracking errors. And if Omic and another competitor on a like-for-like -like basis from that regard, the next factor you'll consider is cost. Is Omic better at a, at a better price point in comparison to, say, a Satrix or a Signia, et cetera? And if all of these factors are the same, I think you as investors and you as the stewards of your clients' portfolios have to really think, what is the next factor that I need to incorporate in terms of assessing which manager is giving me a superior or will give me a better expected outcome. And I think that's where active stewardship really comes to the fore. I mean, Nicole and her team, as I've said, maybe she can give another example of how they've engaged Sassel. I mean, Sassel, if I think about Sassel, this is a big constituent in the Cap Swix or the Swix index funds that we run. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the biggest contributors in terms of carbon emissions in SA. I think it's second to ESCOM. But Sassel at the same time is employing a lot of people. So if we allocate capital away from Sassel, what does that what, what's that impact? It's going to be a negative impact on societies. It's going to be a negative impact on employees and other internal stakeholders. So that's when Nicole and her team, and maybe Nicole you can share, um, in terms of how you and Rob are actually engaging Sassel to ensure that they're meeting certain targets and they're meeting certain metrics when it comes to incorporating ESG into their businesses. Sure. Yeah, so I'm happy to jump in there. So Sassel's a great example. It's one of those companies where um, people will question all the time and say, but if you're a responsible investor, how can you possibly hold Sassel? So like uh, Benicia says, so Sassel is one of the largest carbon emitters um, actually in the world. So in South Africa, it's second, and it's also the single, the single uh, largest single source emitter in the Southern Hemisphere, which is quite significant. It's also a systemically important company that the entire economy depends on, and it also employs 30,000 people in a country with a 40% unemployment rate. So to just if everyone just pulled their money out of Sassel mm -hmm. today, it would be equally irresponsible for a range of other reasons. So really our view is to say, well, let's it makes sense to be invested in this company, but to be invested in this company. So not to lightheartedly trade on this company, but to be really invested and to work with them and say, we recognize the systemic importance of this company and that's why we need it to be better. We need it to be around five, 10, 15 years from now, but we need it to be serving this economy. We need it to be creating economic growth, not detracting from it. We need it to be creating more stable and resilient market, not detracting from that. And that's sort of the purpose of having those kinds of engagements is to make sure that we are keeping an eye on that. Not because we think that we can change everything as one investor, but that when there is opportunity to affect change, we do take that uh, on with um, both hands. And when we realize, if we realize we get to a point where it no longer makes financial sense, then at least we're aware of that and we can get out quickly. So that's sort of how we um, face that kind of thing. So I suppose on the, on the indexation side, it's sort of about saying, if you've got the same products that are yielding sort of the same returns and they're costing you the same thing, but you've got one that's doing more for the broader market and its resilience and its stability. It makes sense to go with that one. So there's another level of engagement that takes place with, which is um, the company visits that you guys do. 
Um, do ESG issues ever come up there? Um, and maybe give us an example. Yeah, so, I mean, we analyze companies, so we choose each and every specific company that we invest in. Um, and so as part of that, we engage, because as Old Mutual Investment Group, the first thing that we need to do um, when Nicole talks about stewardship is to what do we believe good governance is? And, and why does this idea of good governance matter um, if we just start there? I mean, we've lived through Steinhoff. We understand what the consequence of bad governance is. Like a bad investment in our world, maybe you lose 10%, 20%, 30%. But bad governance, you lose everything. And so the cost then of stewarding companies and sitting down with the companies and saying, well, actually, is this board constituted correctly? Are these people that are reputable? Is it diverse enough in terms of intellectual ability? And all of that. So, so that matters. And then who are we voting in the board and who do we vote out? What do we think of remuneration, management remuneration? Are they being rewarded for the right things? Are they being rewarded for the wrong things? And also, then when it comes to, I suppose, the environmental side of it, in terms of if you look far ahead and say, well, how are they taking care of the environment to make sure that they are a sustainable business? Because when they are not a sustainable business, they're going to attract a fine or the ire of government in some sort. And a company will give an example, take Anheuser Bush, the beer company. Now, historically, to produce a litre of beer used to take uh, more than double that, so more than two litres of water. So this is a bit of an issue. Um, and so therefore, what Anheuser Bush, because obviously at the end of the day, you've got to plant barley, so it consumes a lot of water along the value chain. You've got to then say, actually, what's this company's strategy in dealing with that? Because not only are they then better for the environment if they can reduce the amount of water they spend to produce a liter of beer, but actually, from a cost perspective and an efficiency perspective, it's good for them too. And this is why these things, we cannot separate them. We've got to do both of them. Because when the company stewards what it is and actually takes care of the environment, here is an example of a company that then, and, and Anheuser-Busch generates the highest margins in the beer segment in the world, by far. Why? Because they've thought about actually what business are we building and how is that business going to last into the future. And when they do that well, actually it also meets the other objective. Thank you, Sibu. Nicole, I'm going to go back to you now. Um, I think from responsible investing is something that we've been passionate about um, for many years. I think it's probably around 12, 13 years that we've had a dedicated RI team in Old Mutual Investment Group. And we've refined over time. And I know that recently we've settled on some key areas that are important for us as OMIG that we want to focus on or champion. Can you share some of those with us? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. So we, when we're talking about responsible investment in general, um, there's sort of the ESG integration component, uh, which is what we're talking about now, where we've got to take account of things so that we don't end up paying for neglecting them later. Then there's the stewardship component, and then there's really about developing product, right, that can support this. On the stewardship component, we've always been engaging with companies on a company-to-company, company-specific level, one-on-one, -on, -one, on company particular issues, right? That always makes sense, and it's just good risk management. Like Sibo was saying, it makes absolute sense to do that. What has happened in the last year or two is there's been an evolution in the thinking around, well, actually, we think that there are some issues that are systemic in nature, right, that affect every company regardless of what industry they're in or how big they are, um, and that have the ability to destabilize the market, right, to affect the resilience of the market, the ability of the market to generate growth, and that's what we want, right? We want economic growth because that's good for everyone. And so what we did is, you know, undertake an exercise to identify these issues um, and, and really like we were saying, it's all about, it's, it's making sure that we're focusing on issues that make sense because they are financially material. So issues where there's enough evidence on the link between addressing this issue and causing uh, creating economic growth, where there's enough evidence on the role of specific companies and their ability to influence it, and that there's evidence on how do we address this issue at its root, right? So really get down to the systemic nature. And those things are, there's three specific ones. The first one is around the just transition to net zero. So we as Old Mutual have signed up to the Old Mutual, um, to the Net Zero Asset uh, Managers Initiative, where we've committed to 
get our portfolio's emissions to net zero by 2050. Obviously, the only way that we can do that is if the companies in which we invest are on a similar journey. Globally and locally, that is happening. It's inevitable. So we take that transition to lower carbon operations as a given. So what we're focusing on instead is to say, like, let's not achieve that at all costs. Right, so let's make sure that we're achieving that in a socially responsible way. Let's think about things like how it affects labor and communities and build that into our plans and our strategies as companies and as, as investors. So an example is if you look at uh, some of the biggest emitters, obviously, are mining companies. The quickest way for them to decrease their emissions is to just shut down a bunch of operations. But that, is, again, is just irresponsible in a whole range of other different ways. So we're working with the companies in which we invest to have more sustainable approaches to that. The second issue we're looking at is responsible water use, why we're very proud to have ABI as one of our top holdings, because they have a world-leading strategy on that. And then the third thing we're looking at is inequality. So South Africa is the most unequal country in the world, and we recognize that while there's been some progress, there's still a lot of work to do, and we're encouraging companies and ourselves to really look at how we address that on a systemic level. So not just looking at something like a surface level BEE score, but saying, what is our approach to how we find, train, educate, recruit people? How do we help them progress through the organization? Not just because um, it's good for sort of income inequality, but because it also gives us, when you're talking about what this board composition looks like, it means that we're creating a bigger pool of competent people. We've got more of a pipeline. We're not all fighting over the same directors, and it's good for those companies, it's good for the market. So we're taking a very active approach to that. Um, and we're also doing a lot of work on that sort of third component of the product development. We've got a couple of them that, you know, Venetia will also talk to, but we're also working on developing our own sort of proprietary benchmarks to say, well, maybe the way that we're measuring ourselves is not really aligned with where we actually need to go. And maybe we need to start thinking about changing the benchmarks against which we're measured so that we're focused on that resilient, sustainable future. So we've got a lot going on in that space. Glad to hear. Benisha, I'm going to hand over to you to wrap up for us. Can you share with us how you um, capture the emerging market opportunity in the funds that you and your team manage? Thanks, Honsia. So um, if you buy an index fund, you can buy a whole range of index funds that we offer at All Mutual Investment Group. So, of course, we have balance funds and we have standalone capabilities from your local equity to global equity to fixed income and property. However, if you want to tap into this emerging market opportunity, you can do this in two ways. Um, you can buy into the standalone MSCI, Old Mutual MSCI, Emerging Markets, ESG Leaders Index Fund, and I know that's a mouthful. Um, and you can also get that exposure through our balanced capability. So we have a very highly diversified global uh, building block, which gives investors the emerging market exposure. And if you think about the offshore limits that went up last year, Reg 28, um, you now have a bigger opportunity set that's available within those balance funds. But then just talking to the actual fund that we manage, the, the feeder fund, um, these are some of the key attributes, I think, that you should really take home with you today. So number one for me is definitely you buying into a fund where you're getting exposure to these companies that are prioritizing ESG attributes in terms of how they manage their businesses. And by doing that, you are positioning yourself to really tap into consistent and sustainable returns over the long term. The second key highlight for me is when you buy into this best-in-class portfolio, you are tilting towards resilient counters. These are your counters with sound economic modes. Um, businesses that really are mitigating these idiosyncratic risks like fraud, embezzlement, legal events that can really impact negatively your shareholder value proposition and stock price valuations. We also then apply a screening methodology to mitigate these ESG risks and Nicole has talked to, um, where we screen out companies involved in very controversial activities like alcohol, gambling, um, tobacco, contra controversial weapons, for example. And the, this, I'm just naming a few on the list. But the priority and the main objective of this fund is definitely to give you, the investor, a risk and return profile very similar to that of the underlying parent index, which is the MSI Emerging Market Index. And we design this index in such a way that investors get 
um, similar exposure on a sector basis and a similar exposure on a country basis. So it's neutral from that perspective. And by um, buying into this fund, ladies and gentlemen, although we are neutralizing these risks, you're investing in 50% of the universe, which is prioritizing ESG, and look at the outperformance that the EM ESG index, the leaders index, has outperformed by about 2.6% versus its benchmark with a 3.6% tracking error. So, as Nicole likes to put it, um, if you have two chocolate bars and they look identical, they have the same wrapping, they taste the same, but the one has zero calories, I think the choice is basically obvious. You're going to go with the one that has the lowest calories. Um, so I think these are amazing attributes that you can tap into if you invest into the fund. But one of the key highlights for me is that it has a very low fee. I looked at the fact sheet the other day. And if you access this fund through the wealth platform, it's the B1 fee class, you'd be paying 55 basis points. Now, this is less than half the average of the average active managers who are actually you know, producing or delivering similar capabilities, EM capabilities within the market. So ladies and gentlemen, I think just to wrap up on my side, amazing fund, you can see the outperformance, um, and managed by a very experienced team with a 21-year track record, really understanding the nuances and the complexities of 24 emerging markets. Um, we have a mass scale in the business, supported by a very sound team business, and all of this is then available to you at a very low cost. So thanks, Quincy. That's my story for the day. Thanks. Thank you, Benicia. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you, Sylvie.